there's nothing more sexy than a guy that can explain the internal workings of LiveUB and the Node.js event loop faces on a first date. Hey babes, mm -hmm. setting media callbacks running the check handles face. Babe, again with this? How many times have I told you? Okay, it works 90% of the time. All right guys, so before we start, I just want to give a big shout out to the Reddit community that helped me so much, give me, giving me a lot of great feedback. I tend to move my hands a lot and do a lot of things in the video that they're bad habits, so I'm gonna struggle to stop doing them. But I hope that the videos can improve. So in the last episode, we talked about the Node.js internals and we covered everything quickly. And for this one, I just wanna focus a little more on the event loop and the source code and part of like how it works under the hood. So if you're looking at the screen right now, um, I have on the one hand, the diagram for the event loop and on the other hand, the source code. And the source code for LiveUB is just beautiful because if you can read this, it maps to the diagram. So it's like somebody called uh, to code on this diagram, right? So I said to you in the, in the previous episode that uh, the, the event loop is basically at its core a loop, right? So there's a lot more going on. It's a very complex thing. You have state machines and stuff, but at the core, it's just a loop that's going around like this, like this, right? And it has faces and it has cues in the different, in the different faces. So in the beginning of the loop, what you do, if, if the loop is alive and the loop being alive means that you have an active request or uh, handles going on, or you're listening on sockets or something, you, you need to do something basically. So first you check your timers, have my timers expired? And for that, the timers are stored in a mean heap, right? So uh, timers, you know, when you set timeout or set interval, basically a mean heap is a data structure, and this is not a video on data structures, but it's a data structure that guarantees very easy access to the minimum value in the heap. So if you have a timer and the time that is supposed to expire, the mean heap would be, the, the next timer to expire would be first, right? And whenever you pop things off the heap, it will rearrange itself so that access to the minimum value is always fast. That's a property of the data structure. So this is a very convenient data structure for this kind of thing. And by the way, in the comment section, please let me know if this kind of information is very irrelevant. Do you even care that it's a mean heap? Or is this something that only I care about? Uh, anyways, after that, you call pending callbacks. So uh, most of your IO callbacks will be called in the polling for IO phase. But if you have any remaining callbacks that have been deferred for whatever reason, they're gonna be called here. Then you have these two phases, idle handles and prepare handles, which Node uses them internally maybe. Uh, I'm not sure really, I haven't looked at enough of Node's source code. But basically idle handles are kind of poorly named because it's not a handle, it's not a callback that runs when you are idle. They actually run in every tick of the loop. So. Um, and then you have uh, these three sort of phases that are kind of related in the sense that first you prepare for IO, then you block and you do IO, and then you run your checks after that. So check handles are the counterpart to prepare handles. And your set immediate uh, callbacks in, in Node will run here, right? So, and then you have your closing callback. So if you're closing a file or something, it will be called here. So if you look at the code here, this is a source code for LiveUV. Uh, it just runs exactly like that. So you update the time in the beginning, you run your, your idle and prepare handles, and then you calculate for how long you're gonna block for IO. Now, what does it mean to block for IO? I'm gonna discuss this a little more in depth, but basically you want to tell the operating system, hey, has anything happened? But you don't wanna wait forever. So for instance, this timeout is calculated, you try to make it the smallest possible value. So that's how you prevent this from being blocked, right? So if you have a, if you have a closing callback that you call, have to call here or check handle that you have to call here, you don't even block. You just ask the OS what happened and then you, don't even, you block with zero timeout and you carry on. So you can run this. Or in the case that you don't have anything to do and maybe you have a timer, so you could, you could say, well, I'm gonna wait for you for something to happen until my next timer is due, right? If the timer is gonna be due very soon, right? So this is basically the source code for, for LiveUB. And under the hood, there are all things going on, but 
Uh, that's the idea, right? Now, in the in the previous video, we talked about the fact that there are a lot of wrong diagrams about Node.js, and basically that there's a misconception where a lot of people think they go to either extreme, right? Either Node is single-threaded, which is not, or Node uses a thread pool for everything, for all I.O., right? If you're reading from a socket or if you're reading from the file system or whatever. The reality, remember, I said to you was that Node, or leave you be really, uses a thread pool for a very limited number of operations. So whenever it can, it will avoid using the thread pool. Um, and we discussed that there are, you know, two models, basically. I'm not, uh, you can go look at the previous video if you want more info on this, but basically if, Every time you get a socket, you, you spawn a new thread. Uh, that's one thing. It's a, a lot of servers used to do that. And it's okay, but when you have a lot of clients, this becomes very heavy to have a single thread. So the other, the other approach was to have an event loop, pretty much what Node does. Uh, but see, a lot of people think, okay, I have an event loop, but if new requests come in, it's delegated to a worker thread or something like that, right? It will use a worker thread to write to the socket and read from the socket. But that's not much better than this approach because if you have a, a thousand concurrent clients, you this this thread pool that you have that you delegate to here is gonna have a, a thousand threads. So you don't wanna do that. So then how does it work? Like the reality, the secret is that you are able to do with a single thread, serve a ton of clients. But for that, you need the operating system to give you primitives that enable you to do that. So let's think about that. The first thing we need is we need non-blocking operation on sockets, right? So if you get a TCP connection and you establish a connection, whenever you want to send something and whenever you want to receive something, by default, it'll block, right? The operating system, your, your program is gonna block. And let's say you're trying to receive uh, something from a buffer from that connection and there's nothing in it. Well, you will block until some data comes in and then that's not gonna work, right? Because if we have a single thread, then we can only serve one socket at a time. So the first thing you're gonna do is you use a, a, a operating system call um, a, a syscall, or which I'm gonna refer to a lot here, is like an API that the operating system gives you, right? So FNCTL, FNCTL is a syscall that you can use to take a socket and say, hey, I wanna switch to non-blocking mode. And what's, how's that gonna change? Well, let's say that you want to receive data from the socket. If there's something in the, in the buffer, the operating system will give it to you. And if there's nothing, the operating system will say, hey, this operation would block. I, and you can carry on, right? It's not gonna block, it's just gonna warn you. It, it'll block if, I, if you do this. So then you can carry on and then, but then you have to come back later, right? You have, because you didn't block. So later you're gonna have to come back again and say, hey, I wanna receive from this socket. And it will say, it'll block again until there's something. And then you have to do that on a loop a bunch of times. And imagine if, if you have a thousand clients, so you're solving half the problem here because what you really need is a way to tell the operating system, hey, I have, I don't know, these 100 file descriptors, a 100 sockets that I care about. Has anything happened in any of them? And, um, and that, is what is, uh, that is what's called you know, selecting over multiple file descriptors. And you have the select syscall, the poll syscall, and the epoll, which is what I'm gonna discuss now. So this, why is this important? This is important because under the hood, this is how Node achieves its speed, or it's by the use of non-blocking I.O. And these two things together, you can, you can do solid non-blocking I.O. with this, right? So um, basically select an and poll were like the older brothers of the newer epoll. And they both do, all three of them in, in a sense do the same thing. They do it differently, but they kind of aimed at the same thing, which is basically uh, you give the operating system a list of, uh, hey, here are all the things I care about. What change? And I'm gonna wait for two seconds. And if nothing changed in two seconds, uh, just give me control back, right? Or whatever amount of time. Uh, and if something change, you co it comes back right away. And if something changes in one second, it'll come back in one second. Or if nothing happens, then in two seconds you get control back. So this is the timeout 
that you're passing here? For how long am I gonna wait in case nothing has changed? So, um, so select and poll, uh, the problem with them and the reason for ePoll is that they have linear complexity in terms of how long they execute. So what you do is you have an array, for instance, of all your uh, file descriptors or all your connections, just to simplify, uh, all your connections that you care about and you give it to the operating system that is copied into operating system memory and then the operating system will go through them, boom, 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 uh, and then we'll come back to you if something's changed or, or uh, it's a linear time. So as you can imagine, as your number of connections grows, so does the time that it takes to select or pull on those collection on those connections. I'm gonna show a very inter interesting graph that I stole from a website that is quoting a book that is a very good book uh, if you care about Linux programming. Uh, so I'm gonna show you that in the screen, maybe there, uh, no there, uh, and uh, but ePoll is different, right? So the the purpose is is similar, but the way that it works is instead of passing an array, you create an ePoll descriptor, uh, which is basically you, you start sort of like an ePoll file descriptor. I, I, I don't wanna get too technical, but I kinda have to. And then what you do is you start adding things to it. You talk to the operating system and say, hey, remember I created this ePoll structure? Hey, add this descriptor to it or remove this one. And I, we're gonna see source code for that. And then you wait on the thing. And under the hood, ePoll is implemented with a red black tree. This is not a data structure video, but a red black tree basically very quickly is a self-balancing binary search tree. So it's a, it's, a, it's a tree that you use for binary search and it will balance itself as you add or remove things from it. Uh, and basically it allows you to search uh, in, in logarithmic time. Right, so it's not gonna grow linearly. But ePoll, when you're, when you're waiting on ePoll, it offers constant time as opposed to these two, which are linear. And that's the graph, that's the table that I'm gonna show you. And I'm gonna link to where I got it. So to wrap up, let's look at, this, at a little bit of source code that I also uh, stole from that same article, which I'm gonna reference. Um, and here what you're doing is, this is some C code. So if you're a JavaScript programmer, I'm gonna to try to explain this very, very easily, right? You're calling the operating system and say, hey, I wanna create an ePoll instance or file descriptor. I don't know if you know what a file descriptor is, so I don't wanna say it too much. But to simplify, let's just say, hey, create an ePoll data structure in memory for me. And, and then you're gonna, with ePoll cuddle, you're gonna say, hey, on this ePoll that I had created here, uh, I wanna add and this event. And this event is like an object in JavaScript where you say, I care about data coming in on the file descriptor zero. So zero is a standard in in, in, in Linux. So you know your, what you read from the terminal, for instance, your standard in. So anything comes in on, on standard in, uh, I wanna read it I, I wanna add it to ePoll, right? And now, and then you can close that once you're done. But imagine that you insert this code before you close. And so you can do a while loop because you remember, you're not gonna block on, on this, right? And you can say, hey, I wanna wait on this ePoll descriptor that I created here and I added things to it here. I wanna wait now. And I wanna wait for this amount of time and if something happens before, or if this timeout expires, at the end, you're gonna get an event count. And then you can say, hey, uh, three things happen, right? And, and you can process them. Or if zero things happen, you can just go back to your loop, right? Until maybe you don't wanna wait anymore uh, or whatever, your situation changes, right? So for instance, in this case, cause you're reading from a standard input in this program, if you send the word stop, then it's gonna set right into zero and you're gonna leave your loop. But we, here we are only, the cool thing about this is that in this case you have, you're waiting on one thing that you added here, but you could add a lot of connections and use a single loop to, to go through this. And this is how you're able to do non-blocking IO. And this is important because under the hood, at the very core, the very 
bottom of the layer. This is what LiveUB does. It's what Tokyo does if you're using Deno. It's what Java does if you're using uh, the Neo package, right? So this is a primitive, it's used everywhere. So if you understand this, you understand a lot of how non-blocking IO happens. Um, now, let me, let me come back to the, um, to, to the source code for LiveUB. And this is what's happening here. When you're polling, you are, every time you're adding things, you're like you're opening a socket or you're reading a file, under the hood, LiveUB is gonna call something like this. Hey, I wanna add something to my ePoll descriptor. And then when you're polling for IO, after you decide for how long you're gonna wait, which is this thing here, uh, you just wait on that stuff and then you iterate on all the changes and then you call the node callbacks or whatever. So this is why node is fast, not because it has an event loop that uses a thread pool for all input output, precisely the opposite. It's because you, you don't need to block your threads. You can just do this. This is a single thread that could be serving a lot of things you could be waiting on with Ebol, right? And if once you set a, a TCP or UDP socket to non-blocking, uh, yeah, it's getting too long now, but I really appreciate you guys sticking around. And if you like this kind of content, I have more videos come up, coming up. Please subscribe, leave a comment, uh, tell me what I can improve on or what you'd like to see. And um, yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one.